zero five and the new. We thank God for another day of camp, and we thank God for the messages he's sending to us. This will be the third and last message in this three-part series, True Seventh-day Adventism. Now, God has raised up Seventh-day Adventists for a particular work and a particular purpose. And as we know from Revelation chapter 12, when Satan was cast out and cast down, he recognized, according to the scriptures, that his time was short. And he knows that the only way to prolong his life is to distract, frustrate, and annoy the work that God is seeking to carry forward, especially through his end-time remnant. So there are many things that come in which seem good, seem important, and seem pressing, but are not according to God's design. Here we want to focus now, as we pray, on God's distinctive mission 
for his church at this time in our history. And I pray that we would all understand the work for us individually and the work for us in these last days. Let us pray. Eternal God, and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your word to us. We thank you that as we trace the pages of sacred history, and as you have left on record your word in Bible prophecy, we recognize that we have come to very solemn times, and that you expect from your people corresponding works. Awaken us to the understanding that you have a distinctive work and mission for your church in these last days. As we should open your word, as we should hear your voice, may the impressions of your spirit be deep and heartfelt that your good word might be accomplished in all who should hear. Forgive us of our sins. Guide us by your spirit even now, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. True Seventh-day Adventism. The scripture is clear that God will have a final remnant. It's nothing to doubt. The scripture is emphatic that God will have a final remnant who will finish the work of God. God has called the Advent movement to prepare for the second coming of Christ, and this is their overall message and highest aim. You know, from time to time, we see persons who focus a lot on health, and that is good, health is important, but is that the overall mission that God has called us for? We hear those who focus a lot on medical missionary work, and medical missionary work is important, but is that the work that God has raised up Seventh-day Adventists to do, true Seventh-day Adventism? That work is to prepare for the second coming of Christ and this is their overall message and highest aim. And the scripture bears it out. Revelation 12, 17, you can read it with me. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Spirit of Prophecy, Revelation 19.10. The testimony of Jesus, when we compare it to our next scripture, is the witness that Christ gave of his Father. The testimony of Jesus, a testimony is the witness that Jesus gave to answer certain questions that arose. But Satan was very angry, and he, met, and he went to make war against God's remnant people. Revelation 12, 17. Our next scripture, Revelation 14, 12, we can read it together. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So here they're keeping the commandments of God, all ten, and they have what the Bible calls the faith of Jesus. And as we compare both scriptures together, both of them say they keep the commandments of God, but one says they have the testimony of Jesus, and Revelation 14, 12 says they have the faith of Jesus. So we are sure then that in the faith of Jesus, must be the testimony or witness of Jesus. Through the faith of Jesus, there must be that witness of the Father. Are you following me? 
Are you following me? All right. Let's go. Let's continue. God has revealed through the writings of the spirit of prophecy that the church is caught in a great controversy over the character and government of God. Are you aware, do you know, that before the distinctive message that God gave through Ellen White, there was not so much known as a great controversy? William Miller didn't know. Martin Luther and all the great reform reformers didn't know. They had an idea, but God had put together such an incredible truth in this great controversy that it now becomes a central focus for true self-day Adventism. That is why there are many who are drifting along and falling off into a Sardis gospel again of only believe and missing this great controversy between Christ and Satan. Because they're holding on to a Reformation gospel that does not take into account this great conflict. But God had given it, God has given it, through the spirit of prophecy, to his remnant church. This is this quote from Education. The Bible is its own expositor. Through the Bible, we are to learn what the scriptures mean. We are to compare scripture with scripture. A great reformation principle. The Bible and the Bible only. Scripture is to be compared with scripture. The student should learn to view the word as a, as a whole and to see the relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme. What is the grand central theme of the scriptures? What is the grand central theme of the scriptures? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. God's love. Okay. Of God's original purpose for the world, and listen to this, of the rise of the great controversy and of the work of redemption. So the student of scripture must know God's original purpose for the world, the grand central theme of the scriptures, the rise of the great controversy, and the work of redemption. He should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy. What are those two principles? What are those two principles? God's selfless, agape love, versus the principle of self. He should understand the nature of these two principles in the great controversy and should learn to trace their workings through the records of history and prophecy to the great consummation. You see what a student of prophecy is to do? The student of the word of God? Trace the rise of these two great principles, God's agape of love, from the opening of the great controversy right through to the end, and also the rise of selfishness to the consummation. Let's continue. He shall see how this controversy enters every phase of human existence, experience. How in every act of life, he reveals the one or the other of the two antagonistic motives. And how, whether he will or not, he is even now deciding upon which side of the controversy he may be found. So the only two sides in this great controversy, the side of God's agape love or the side of selfishness and sin. And the student of the scriptures must trace their development all through history and prophecy to the great consummation. Let's continue. 
God, therefore, is on trial in the person of his saints as to whether the principle of selfless love will conquer the principle of selfish of the principle sorry of selfishness you see the great controversy is not so much about us you know which we'll come to in a moment the great controversy is between who has the right to you rule the universe and God is on trial in the person of his saints This is in Romans 3, 4. Paul in Romans 3, 4. And Paul took Romans 3, 4 from Psalms chapter 51. Turn it with me in your, in your Bibles. Turn to Psalms 51. Turn it with me. Psalms 51 and verse 4. Paul quoting from the Old Testament. Then we'll read Romans 3, 4. Paul got this understanding from the Old Testament in Psalms 51 and verse 4. And then we'll read... What Paul writes in Romans 3, 4, and we'll put it all together. Psalms 51 and verse 4 tells us, here's David, that great psalm of repentance. Listen to how Paul interpreted it, interpreted it by the Holy Spirit. David speaking, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Then David says, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Who's doing the judging there? God said, when thou judgest. Now look at Romans 3, 4, where Paul got the understanding. Paul says, which is on the screen, God forbid, yea, let God be true, and every man a, and a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sins, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. When thou art judged. So in Psalms 51, 4, David is saying, that thou mightest be justified when thou judgest. And here Paul gets the understanding that God must be justified in his sins when he, God, is judged. And how is God judged? God is judged in the person of his saints who profess to be his witnesses to vindicate his character. God must prove in this great controversy that his love can win against all satanic onslaught. Against all. He must prove that through love and freedom, his kingdom can stand. And that's the mission of the church. That's the mission of true Seventh-day Adventism. To prove God right and see it and wrong. Listen, it says, the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8.14. What does Daniel 8.14 say? Can we repeat it? Daniel 8.14. And he said unto me, Let's do it again. Daniel 8, 14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. A lot of controversy over that word cleansed. It can also be translated justified, restored, set right, vindicated. What is the sanctuary, by the way? Who dwells in the sanctuary? God dwells in the sanctuary. God's throne is in the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the seat of God's government. And as we've been studying, in the sanctuary, God purposed to show his purpose for the human soul. But not only that, the sanctuary is the very seat of God's government. And therefore, for the sanctuary to be cleansed, restored, justified, or set right, it means that the government of God must have been, certain charges would have been made against the government of God that need 
to be clear to all intelligent minds. Are you following me? Can you clear a dispute by an announcement? For example, if someone is charged of a crime, let's say they were charged of a crime of stealing, the charge is laid, of course, there's immediate reaction of suspicion. Can the defendant stand up and say, I am innocent, I didn't do it, and that settled the matter once and for all? To intelligent free creatures? No, can't. No amount of argument can settle a dispute where charges are laid in terms of settling an accusation. When accusations are made and charges are laid, there must be a demonstration of the fact, and this demonstration comes true very often, very difficult and trying situation. If there's a breakdown of trust between two individuals, can an announcement of, I am trustworthy now work? No. It has to be now tested and proved that that person can be trusted and depended and relied on through many and varied situations. Similarly, the charges that God's law cannot be kept and that Satan is keeping his creatures down, sorry, that God is keeping his creatures down to exalt himself must be proven by those own free creatures freely trusting God and depending on God in difficult situations and proving that God's law can work. That will answer once and for all the charges of the enemy. And this is done by free creatures choosing freely to trust and work and do all for the Lord. So the cleansing of the sanctuary and the exaltation of the fallen sons of Adam witness to the fact that God is the God of love. Because they will freely choose, the remnant will freely choose to trust God in every situation. Listen to this now. Desire of Ages, page 21. That chapter, Emmanuel, God with us. The very charges Satan had placed on his loving creator will fully be exposed by the church to end all questions and doubts against the divine government. Those are my words there. Now for the statement. But turning from all lesser representations, we behold God in Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, we see that is the glory of God to give. I do nothing of myself, said Christ. The living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father. I seek not mine own glory, but the glory of him that sent me. John 8, 28, 6, 57, 8, 50, 7, 18. In these words is set forth the great principle, which is the law of life for the universe. All things Christ received from God, but he took to give. Amen. The very government of God, the very life of God, the very way that God's government operates, Christ demonstrated. So in the heavenly courts, in his ministry for all created beings, through the beloved Son, the Father's life flows out to all. Through the Son, it returns in praise and joyous service, a tide of love the, to the great source of all. And thus, through Christ, the circuit of beneficence is complete, representing the character of the great giver, the law of life. Hallelujah. Now this statement. In heaven itself, this law was broken. Sin originated in self-seeking. Lucifer, the covering cherub, 
desire to be first in heaven. He sought to gain control of heavenly beings, to draw them away from their creator and to win their homage to himself. Therefore, he did what? He did what? He misrepresented God, attributing to him the desire for self-exaltation. For Satan to accomplish his plan, he had to misrepresent the character of God, and this he did by attributing to God his own character, Satan's own character. With his own evil characteristics, he sought to invest the loving creator. Thus, he deceived angels. Thus, he deceived men. He led them to doubt the word of God. Notice, he led them to doubt the word of God and to distrust his goodness. Because God is a God of justice and terrible majesty, Satan caused them to look upon him as severe and unforgiving. Thus he drew men to join him in rebellion against God. And the night of war settled down upon our world. How did it settle down? Men distrusted the word of God, they doubted his goodness, and they joined Satan in rebellion against God. These are pages, page 21, paragraph 2, and paragraph 3. It continues. In stooping to take upon himself humanity, Christ revealed a character opposite to the character of Satan, praise the Lord. We are told that the condescension of Christ was an almost infinite humiliation to take the nature of Adam before the fall. But Christ took the nature of Adam after the fall. God became the God-man, praise the Lord. And it continues, but he stepped still lower in the path of humiliation. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Philippians 2.8. As the high priest laid aside his gorgeous pontifical robes and officiated in a white linen dress of the common priest, so Christ took the form of a servant and offer a sacrifice. Himself the priest, himself the victim. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Isaiah 53 and verse 5, Zerbiz, page 25, paragraph 1. And listen, it says, Through Christ's redeeming work, the government of God stands justified. The omnipotent one is made known as the God of love. Satan's charges are refuted and his character unveiled. Rebellion can never again arise. Sin can never again enter the universe. Through eternal ages, all are secure from apostasy because of the work of Christ. By love's self-sacrifice, the inhabitants of earth and heaven are bound to their creator in bonds of indissoluble union. These are pages 26, paragraph 2. The work of redemption will be complete. Listen to this. In the place where sin abounded, grace much more abounds, praise the Lord. The earth itself the very field that Satan claims as his is to, is to be not only ransomed, but exalted. Praise the Lord. Our little world, under the curse of sin, the one dark blot in his glorious creation, will be honored above all other worlds in the universe of God. Zerbages, page 26, paragraph 3. So not only... Has God redeemed fallen humanity? Not only has God 
lifted man to the very throne of God. But our very world, where this exper experiment of sin has been going on, will be exalted, oh praise the Lord. It should be clear then that the work of the final remnant is to vindicate the character of God before the universe. And two, by the grace of God, cooperate with God in accomplishing his eternal purpose, to have a universe free of sin that his creatures may share in his love. There are some undeniable truths in scripture that God uses to accomplish this work. One, the fact that God has in Christ redeemed fallen humanity and all men righteous or wicked stand legally justified in Christ. When we understand this truth more clearly, we no longer wonder if God is willing to save us, but we understand that God by his love has already canceled the condemnation in the first Adam. And we no longer have to doubt whether God will accept us but we accept the free gift that God is freely willing to bestow. God has redeemed all mankind in the second Adam. And all men stand legally justified in Christ. I like what one Seventh-day Adventist author puts it. He says all men are born forgiven. They're born forgiven. Two. Perfection of character is not only a possibility, but a present reality in the man Christ Jesus who ministers as our high priest. So Satan can no longer trip us up with the sophistry that there are defects that are impossible for us to overcome. As we look to Jesus, we see perfection possible in the second Adam. And we understand that he as us overcame all for us so we in him can do it too. Amen. Three, the judgment will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. Love's self-sacrifice is effective to produce a final remnant. The judgment will show that there are a people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. For the preaching of the three angels' messages, for, sorry, and for the preaching of the three angels' messages, there has been a very special message, end time message of warning, committed to God's remnant church. The preaching of the three angels' messages, a call of reform, a call for God's people to come up higher and to give that final warning message which will prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. Therefore, nothing should distract or divert the minds of true Seventh-day Adventists from doing the, this most solemn work. In a special sense, this quote is from Review and Herald, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their, their attention. The most solemn truths ever entrusted to mortals have been given to us to proclaim to the world. The proclamation of these truths is to be our work. The world is to be warned and God's people are to be true to the trust committed to them. They are not to engage in speculation. Neither are they to enter into business enterprises with unbelievers. 
This would hinder them in their God-given work. Christ says of his people, Ye are the light of the world, Matthew 5, 14. It is not a small matter that the counsels and plans of God have been, clear, have been so clearly opened to us. It is a wonderful privilege to be able to understand the will of God as revealed in the sure word of prophecy. This places us on us a heavy responsibility. God expects us to impart to others the knowledge he has given us. It is his purpose that the divine and human instrumentalities shall unite in the proclamation of the warning messages. Testimonies, volume 9, page 19. As God is leading out a people, as we begin to wind down to a close, for the accomplishment of his purpose, they are therefore to be true to their trust, faithfully doing the work given them of God. Let everyone who claims to believe the Lord's soon coming search the scriptures as never before, for Satan is determined to try every device possible to keep souls in darkness and to blind the mind to the perils of the times in which we are living. Let every believer take up his Bible with earnest prayer that he may be enlightened by the Holy Spirit as to what is truth that he may know more of God and of Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Search for truth as for hidden treasures and disappoint the enemy. The time of test is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the same pardon and redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. For it is the work of everyone to whom the message of warning has come to lift up Jesus, to present him to the, to the world as revealed in types and shadows, as manifested in the revelations of the prophets, as revealed in the lessons given to the, his disciples, and in the wonderful miracles wrought for the sons of men. Search the scriptures, for they are they that testify of him. If you will stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ and appropriate the gift of his righteousness, which he imputes to every repentant sinner. I pray that we would understand our distinctive mission and our trust. I pray that the word of God will dwell in us richly. And as we contemplate these themes, the mission of true Seventh-day Adventism, to honor and to vindicate the character and the government of God, we will rise to the challenge and his good work might be done in us. Let us pray. Eternal God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the rich gifts you have bestowed upon us, your children. We thank you that in the word, we can see your love revealed in Jesus Christ. We thank you that though Adam would have fallen into sin, and sold out the human race that because you are the God of love you couldn't sit idly by and leave guilty man to perish but instead you made the infinite sacrifice for all of us that indeed we might be called the sons and daughters of God that mankind might have us have a second chance and that indeed, your love may fill whomsoever will. As we have arrived at this time in Earth's history, where we recognize that we are in a great controversy 
over your character and your government. May we align ourselves to your truth, recognizing what wonderful things you have done for us, and being motivated by that love, surrender to you and allow you to accomplish your good purpose in our lives. Inspire us to pray. Inspire us to trust you more that the work, that that good work you have begun in us might be completed unto the day of Jesus Christ. We pray for your work as it advances throughout the world. We pray now even for our camp meeting. We continue to pray for a blessing upon all those here physically, all those watching on via the internet, all those who were unable to make it, Continue to advance your work in the earth. And may we allow you to finish that work, firstly in us, that you may finish the work in the earth. Have mercy upon us. Forgive us of our sin. Forgive our slothfulness. Forgive our weakness. And keep us by your grace. We thank you. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. And amen. You can have a short five minute break before we go into our next session before lunch. God bless. So after the break, we'll be continuing our group book study. Last session before lunch. In fact, the last session for the day because after lunch is usually Sabbath preparation. And of course, we have a, a Sabbath night session tonight. So a short break, and then we break into our groups. Thank you. <laughs>